Welcome everyone to our special show, The Gig Economy. Tim and I have not officially been replaced by a handy journalist that we would have found on that platform. Uh, but for the next half hour, we're going to be exploring how non-traditional earn-as-you-go jobs are growing and transforming the labor market. Well, let's start off with what exactly the gig economy looks like. Some of the most common gigs include driving for Uber, delivering food for Uber Eats or Postmates, walking dogs with WAG, or doing random jobs on TaskRabbit and more. But what they all have in common is independent workers getting paid per task instead of earning a salary or hourly wage. That's right, and according to the Gig Economy Data Hub, more than a quarter of U.S. workers participate in the gig economy to some extent, and more than 10% rely on gig work for their primary income. The number of gig workers is only growing. But that growth comes with some concern and controversy, including how much workers should get paid, whether they should get benefits, and what role government regulation should play in the industry. So we're here to break it all down over the next half hour. That's right. First, let's explore the changing workforce and how gigs fit into its future. Joining us now is Jake Schwartz, the CEO of General Assembly, a global education provider. Uh, Jake, what kind of shift are you seeing when it comes to gig and freelance work? Well, you know, we train people around the world and work with about half of the Fortune 500, helping them upskill and reskill their workers. And so what we see is this constant push towards um, all different places on the spectrum of what you would call gig or freelance work, meaning it's not entirely just Uber or WAG and this sort of app-based employment. It's also just this basic idea of remote, uh, an idea of flexible, an idea of you know, value-based compensation as opposed to just salary. Um, and a lot of the surveys suggest that it is what younger people want and value is flexible. Actually, not just younger people, also, you know, um, moms coming back to the workforce, older people, which is going to become a, a hotter and hotter topic in the world of work. And so um, I think what's happening is this, the conventional idea of what a job is um, is sort of being blown up by all these different models, enabled by technology. But how does that sort of gel with what workers expect or what Americans want, I guess, uh, from a traditional employer? Benefits, health care, retirement. How, how, can the, how can the two meet? Well, I think first of all, it's important to note that it's not like all or nothing. I mean, most of our graduates, the first couple of years they graduate having learned software development or data scientist, data science, that they will go into a typical job. It's probably the best way, place to learn. You get some stability and some reliability. Um, but as you get more expertise, especially in a skill set that has power in the workplace, you can sort of determine what you want to do. And I think um, companies are not going to be shy about wanting people who will work full time. That's not where this pressure is coming from at the top of the um, sort of skills mm -hmm. um, hierarchy. I think um, there's a lot of questions around you know, the government framework about how we regulate this at every state around what labor laws are, how you define an employee, um, how the IRS wants you to treat them. All of these things right now are sort of in flux and you see it all the time. I mean, every startup um, that exists basically gets a lawsuit in California because there's money to be made there, but also because these laws were not written at a time when the sort of flexible workforce concept even existed. So you mentioned that flexibility, right, is something that workers really of all generations are valuing more and more. It's becoming more of a reality. But what about Gen Z and Millennial? For those generations, right, how is their workforce changing and how are they changing the workforce? Well, I would say in many ways, they come with a, a completely different perspective. Um, you know, in many ways, they want to see, they are big believers in work-life balance. Um, they want to believe in the mission of what they're doing, even when it's part-time. Um, and they kind of want to have it all in terms of they want to have their fun, they want to be able to have a job, they want it to uh, grow, they want to be able to grow and develop and get promoted immediately sometimes, which is kind of funny. Um, but this is all really around um, the same, I think it's the same stuff that people always wanted, it's just the expectations are a little higher and there's a more sense that I can go out and get it and I can ask for it. And because technology has made everything so readily available, and so it's so obvious that you don't need to be in the office every day to do your work, right? That why 
why should I have to go in and commute and put up with all this just so I can get my paycheck when I can do all my work at home? Unless you're a TV broadcaster. That's right. Jim and I can now be Skyping in from, you know, who Not knows? Yet, but and but, but they do have very good versions of sort of robots. I, I would be bet within a couple of years you could. Like, honestly, I mean, you get a couple cameras, you know, you're just going to have to do your own makeup. That's probably the hardest <laughs> thing. That is hard. Uh, Jake, I wanted to talk a little bit about how someone preps for, for, uh, for your coursework. Yes. And what you really you should you would want to see maybe from public education and from from public educators right now to maybe be better prepared for jobs of the future jobs of today yeah so you know we you could broadly say the stuff we teach is all around um, this general theme of what companies call digital transformation but digital transformation is actually very simple it's really around this idea that um, the the level of technology, technological capability that now exists allows for companies to do a lot of different things with their data. Now, on one level, that means that it allows them to talk to their customers through a bunch of different channels, including social media um, and all sorts of alternative ways. Um, it also allows them to understand their customers better through giant databases and all the clicks and everything like that, which is where a lot of the privacy controversies come from. But even underneath that, this whole idea of cloud and cloud infrastructure is really probably the fundamental change. And so we really sort of attack each layer of those stacks. But I think the core concept here is this is all about quantitative thinking and logical thinking. And so um, when people talk about, you know, should grade schools be teaching kids how to code, I think like, yeah, it's nice, it's fun, maybe it's a nice way to teach math. But the reality is, is this, we just need more numerate people. And, and numeracy is the path to success in the future. Um, and so everything is about data at the end of the day. And I think data is going to be the guaranteed job of the future for, for many, many, many years to come. I think there's certainly an argument that creativity is going to keep you employed too, right? Sure. With AI and automation uh, in different sectors. But quickly, at what point do you think there is a point when gig workers uh, out pace the number of traditional employment workers? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. It's probably when, um, you know, the idea of a corporation is not about, you know, you know how company CEOs always say our people are our business, right? Things like that. When that becomes no longer true for the majority of businesses, you know, the ones that are listed on the stock exchange, where the core asset of most of these businesses is not people at desks doing work and having meetings and doing sales, but instead a, a server and an algorithm in the back office. We have a handful of companies that are like that today, but I think we're pretty far from, from the day where robots are replacing all those people. Q. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our next segment, that's right, What Keeps You Going is brought to you by Duncan, where we feature the habits of fast-paced and high-energy entrepreneurs and executives who are always on the go. And we're here with Jake Schwartz, the CEO of General Assembly. Jake, how do you beat the midday slump if you get one? Um, well, you know, I used to get the midday slump like crazy. I'm a, I'm a heavy napper, and so, you know, after <laughs> lunch, I would just really want to, like, hide somewhere, you know. Um, what I stopped doing is eating carbs for lunch. It's amazing what that does. It's sort of one of the little hacks that I've done. And I stopped eating carbs, uh, you know, almost entirely except for weekends, you know, when I started General Assembly, and it really kept me going. It's, and, and then, of course, a cup of coffee always helps. That right? does help. I'm like a bagel every morning type of person. So oh, that's like, really bad for yeah, you, uh, man. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. thanks, Jake. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, what does being a go-getter mean to you? Um, you know, I think, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so the way I tend to think about it is when you wake up in the morning, um, do you see the world as, as a bunch of things that won't happen unless you show up, or do you think it will happen regardless, right? Could you stay in bed with the covers over your head and everything goes on just the same? Um, or do you see it as something that um, you can take actions and that will have results and that will have things that will impact other things? Mm -hmm. So. You know, that for me is, is, you know, when I started out being an entrepreneur, it was all about waking up and being like, okay, if I don't do it, no one else will. And I think having that attitude is more and more important every day, you know, regardless of where, where or what you're doing in the workplace. So true. Uh, Jake, last question for you. What is one app other than email that you couldn't live without? Oh, man. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a... I, you know, I got a lot of time sort of in between meetings and traveling and things like that. So I, right now I'm just obsessed with the New York Times crossword app. That's what I do so all So you're day not long. napping, you're doing crosswords. That's right. Well, when I'm not <laughs> napping, I'm doing crosswords. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, Jake Schwartz, thank you for joining us and taking a break from your crossword there. He's the CEO of General Assembly. Great to be here. Thanks, Thanks guys. Good to see you. Well, coming up, e-commerce for freelancers. How one platform is evolving the tech behind the transactions right after this.
Welcome back to the gig economy. Workers looking for gigs and freelance jobs aren't limited to specific apps like Uber and Lyft. They also have the option of taking a more e-commerce style route. I recently sat down with Micha Kaufman, the CEO of Fiverr, to find out how his platform is serving both freelancers and the companies looking for their services. Take a look. Micha, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on Cheddar. Thanks for having me. I want to talk about the most recent quarter. You reported uh, earnings of just about a month ago. In the most recent quarter, uh, revenue higher by 42%, active buyers higher by 16%, spend per buyer higher by 15%. You guys raised your revenue forecast okay. for this quarter. Um, but the stock's still hovering right now, just, just about at its IPO price. What are investors missing here? Yeah. No, I think we've had a very strong year. And, um, and I think the business is uh, working on all fronts, which is great. We're, this, is, this is how we can influence the, um, uh, the, uh, the business. I think the stock is going to sort itself out. The uh, lockup expired just this week. So I think that ahead of lockups, what we've seen with other companies is that there's, there's some down pressure in the market, anticipating that there's going to be potentially high sell, which we don't have in our case. So I think that if, if you look at yesterday, the, the stock started going up. And I think that over time, it's just building market trust, continu continuing to execute in, in the right pace. And then the stock is going to sort itself out. As you've been sure. involved in, in this for years at this point, what are the newest trends that you're seeing when it comes to the gig economy? Well, so um, I, I think that for us, it's more the freelancing economy than the gig economy. How, I do, think you that, see, how do you see the difference between the two? Because well, I think th some freelancers would say, hey, I, yeah, I, I do define myself as a gig worker. Yeah. So I, I think that the nature of the business of Fiverr is very, very different uh, than, than most companies that put themselves under the umbrella of the gig economy. I think that the fact that we've productized services, we've created this service as a product uh, system that allowed us to become an e-commerce company, not a stuffing business, is very different. The fact that freelancers on our platform have total freedom on what they're offering, when they work, how much they charge for it. These are all fundamentals that makes our business very different. And I think that this is why it's, it's, it's um, differentiated in, in the way the business grow. It's, and beyond that, I think w when you look at it, freelancers on our platform are just making more money every year and pricing their services up every year. So instead of being a race to the bottom, it's a race to the top. So, so this is why we're, we're focusing on differentiating that story. Do you think that race to the top, as you, as you term it, will continue as we do see more and more people turning to this type of work, the freelance economy? Oh, absolutely. I think what, what, what our market base allows is the creation of your online uh, brand, your ability to create your, um, your profile and start building your reputation and rating. And the more you do that, the more demand there is to your services and the higher the prices that you can charge for it. It's, it's basic demand and supply. Is part of your, what you see happening in the future, this, this fundamental shift between from the way that, that people are employed today to being employed more in terms of freelance work? Like, do you ever anticipate that freelance work will overtake traditional full-time paid gigs? Some studies say it will. I, I think that what we see is a, is a momentum in, the, in freelancing in general. It's not slowing down right now. I think more and more people like to have freedom over what they work on and, and when. And I think that they're seeking platforms such as Fiverr to, to pursue their, their dreams and careers. So, so we're not seeing any change in that trend. I think that traditional employment is going gonna, is gonna to stay. You know, none of these trends is, is going away. But I think that more and more companies understand that they can utilize this massive workforce in, in a very flexible way. Miha, do you think at some point, or, or would you say that Fiverr actively would like to see some sort of changes to the way that healthcare exists in the United States or benefits exist throughout the world to make it better for freelancers to work in this economy? Sure. I, I think that as, as a company that is basically a market base that enables this, um, we would like to um, we would like to see changes in this area. This is not our business, but wherever 
we can use the fact that we're a massive market base that can potentially negotiate better terms for our freelancers, we will do that. We, we've done it before with healthcare and we'll continue doing that. So, so is the experience of being a freelancer, for example, in a country that has a nationalized uh, healthcare program, is it better than being a freelancer in the United States, for example, where you're, you have to buy private insurance? Well, I, I think the, the, the two approaches are, are very, very different. I'm not sure if there's one that is better than the other, but I think that given the fact that this is a, a, new, a new force in, in the workforce, th that requires some, some new uh, ways of thinking. And I think it's just, it's just taking a few years to figure this out. As, as much as we can be proactive in helping um, this take form or shape, we would love to do that. All right. yeah, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us on Chatter today. Thank you. That was Michal Kaufman, the CEO of Fiverr, joining us recently talking all about how he thinks differently about gig work versus freelance work. So true. Uh, well, coming up, self-employed means self-tracking. What gig workers need to know ahead of tax time. Welcome back to the gig economy, everyone. One of the biggest differences between gig jobs and more traditional employment is taxes. While conventional employers withhold from regular paychecks, the companies behind gig jobs do not. Instead, being self-employed means tracking it all yourself. And joining us now is Kathy Pickering. She's executive director of the Tax Institute at H&R Block. Uh, Kathy, what are the top things that gig workers need to know ahead of this tax season? So. The gig economy means you're self-employed, you're your own boss, so congratulations, right? That's really fun. However, everything that your employer used to do for you, filing, tracking, paying your taxes, now you're responsible for doing that. There's a lot of things that people need to know, and especially first-timers often get caught by surprise. Mm -hmm. So we would highlight that h and Block has a great service, which is perfect for people that are really comfortable with technology. It's called TaxPro Go. You can just take pictures of your docs on your phone, upload it into a secure environment, and the tax pro will take it and do it all from there. What do you think the biggest mix misconceptions are about tax requirements when it comes to gig workers? So for gig workers, they don't understand a lot of times that they need to be paying taxes throughout the year. When you're an employee, you're having that money withheld and it's being paid on your behalf. Right, you see that in every, every paycheck. In every paycheck. You look paycheck. at your paycheck and you see what's held, withheld mm -hmm. by the state and what's withheld by the federal government. The other thing is that when you work for an employer, they're paying 
half of the taxes. When you're working for yourself, you're also required to pay self-employment taxes. That's what's going for funding your Social Security when you want to retire, those kinds of things. And a lot of people get surprised by that. Are there, is there a way to make it easier, right, on a, a paycheck by paycheck uh, basis that adds to the ease of the process for the gig worker? Yeah, I, nowadays with all the technology enablement, it's so much easier. There's apps you can track things. Say, for example, you're an Uber driver, you've got a platform that helps you track your expenses, because not only do you need to report your income, but now you've got all these other expenses that you can use to report your, you know, your against your income and reduce your taxable amounts. And those kinds of things, the more that you can automate that, the easier that it gets. When it comes to taxes, definitions really matter and terminology really matter. So let's talk about the term self-employed. How does that how does that really apply to somebody who is a gig economy worker? Is an Uber driver self-employed? So the difference between um, a traditional employee and being self-employed is who is directing your work. And this is long-standing rules. They've been in effect for a long time. It's who's controlling the work, telling you when and how you do it. You know, Uber drivers and uh, Grubhub delivery, that kind of thing. You turn on when you want to work and then you turn off when you don't want to work and you, you set the rules around how you're going to engage. Whereas if I decided to tell my employer that I didn't want to show up today, they might have something else to say about it. So it's understanding those rules. Another thing that's important for drivers in particular to understand is there's a lot of complexity in the mileage tracking. You have to be able to segregate the difference between personal mileage and business mileage and when do you get to start counting it. So there's a lot of rules like that and this is a great time to get help if you're not well ensconced in that. And you know, H&R Block has tax pros that are specifically certified in gig economy returns, so it's a great way to get some help. Are there any changes on the horizon to tax policy that you expect? So one of the things that we're seeing is that on the Form 1040, there's a new question this year. Uh, last year, you know, we had the big tax reform and the big change. This year, there's a new question, and it's, did you have or transact in virtual currency? So the IRS is reaching out to try to understand who's involved in cryptocurrency. And this is the kind of thing that um, people might not understand. You may not even think, oh, I bought some Bitcoin a while ago and I didn't think I was really doing anything with it. Um, so it's a great time to get help. A lot of people who like to do cryptocurrency, they're more technology savvy. They tend to like to do it themselves. And that's the kind of question you don't want to make a mistake on because mm -hmm. now it's under penalty of perjury if you don't answer that question correctly. We have the ability to direct chat with our, our clients um, and it's called online assist, but you can be doing your own taxes and then say, oh, wait a minute, I got a question here. I don't know how to answer this question and we can make sure you get it right. All right, crypto buyers, uh, beware. <laughs> yes. That's Kathy Pickering. She's the executive director of the Tax Institute at H&R Block. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. And to wrap things up, Cheddar hit the streets of New York City to find out what customers think of gig workers. Almost everyone told us they've used Uber and Uber Eats and they also had similar opinions about whether the people who bought them and the service should be treated like full-time employees. Take a look. Um, well, they're providing a service to the public, so I think they should be treated as full-time employees as well. 100% that they should get that, because yeah. that, otherwise they're working and doing a service for the people, normal people like us, uh, and they're not getting the benefits from it. So that is very unfair, yeah. I think it depends. Like, if they're good, then yes, but if they're not, then no. I think it's the end of the day, it's a job and it's a service that we pay for, so they should be kind of compensated for that. I think it's a good idea, just because I know a lot of people that do it don't make a lot of money, but like they do it full time, so I think it'd be better to give them a little more benefits so that they kind of make something out of it rather than just driving people around for nothing, really. Okay, everyone, it's a wrap. Thank you for watching The Gig Economy. A look at your Cheddar 50 Movers is next.